like that. All right, open your Bibles, please, now to the book of Matthew, chapter 3. John the Baptist is coming to town, and he's uh, preaching uh, that uh, message of fire and, uh, and condemnation. If you don't repent, you're going to perish. And uh, he is telling people, I'm here as a voice to make ready for the way of the Lord. And so then Jesus comes to him, and uh, verse 13 of chapter 3, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And he suffered him, or he permitted him. The idea there is that Jesus uh, had no sin. He was perfect and pure in every way, but he gave an example that everyone who trusts him as Savior should be baptized uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's given to us an example that we should follow his steps. And then Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. The reason he came as a dove is because a spirit hath no body and you couldn't see unless he had a bodily shape. So he came in the shape of a dove. So the Holy Spirit sat upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You have the Trinity here. Uh, the Lord Jesus, the God the Son in the water. Uh, the voice from heaven, God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son and uh, the Holy Spirit coming in a bodily shape as a dove lighting upon him. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. I, I want you to know immediately that this was done for our benefit. This was not done for Jesus' benefit. He's the Son of God, and uh, he had nothing to prove to anybody. But he uh, came through this time of temptation to teach us how we should face temptation. And so we would know what kind of temptations we would have uh, in our lives. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry and hungry. I, I think probably that statement was made to shock us. Would he not be hungry after he's not eaten for 40 days and 40 nights? That would probably be the most important thing in anyone's life. If he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, the most important thing would be to get something to eat. It would be the thing that would drive a human being. He would be hungry after that length of time. And uh, when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Luke pointed out one particular stone, probably the shape of uh, some bread, and said, Command this stone to be made bread. Now, obviously, that would appeal to someone who hadn't eaten in 40 days and 40 nights. In fact, I think probably... This temptation was uh, an appeal to his senses. Uh, hunger, probably, I, I don't know if many of you have had the experience of having homemade bread. Oh, and when that comes out of the oven and that aroma is just so wonderful. I mean, it's just the greatest thing uh, since sliced bread is having good homemade bread, yeast raised bread. It's wonderful, and so that might have appealed to the senses, uh, the emotions of thinking how wonderful it would be to have the taste of bread in your mouth. And so he say, why don't you, if you're the Son of God and you're all-powerful, well, then won't you just make these stones bread so you'd have plenty to eat after you've hungered for 40 days and 40 nights. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now Jesus didn't put away eating here. 
He said, man shall not live by bread alone. You need the bread. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, when you hear uh, something like that or read it in the scripture, you know that he's talking about the Bible. Because every word is talking about the word of God. Uh, from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 20 to 21, it's the word of God. God spoke it and men wrote it down word by word. There's no other book in the universe like the Bible. And if you have the King James Bible, you have the word of God. You read and you reading God's word. And Jesus said, you must live on the word of God. I, I think you understand what he's teaching us here. And what he's saying to us is something very important because the temptation that we will have is the temptation to put the physical and the emotional over the spiritual. Jesus said, you must have the word of God. And so he said, uh, I'm not going to be tempted to, for, to make bread out of these stones because I've got to live by the word of God. And each of us have got to come to this place where we realize Satan's going to tempt us uh, to pamper the flesh, to pamper the body, and to sometimes a legitimate need. I mean, here was a legitimate need. Having not eaten for 40 days, he's hungry. But Jesus has given to us the example to say, no matter how much your body demands it, no matter how much your spirit and your soul, uh, your emotions want it, you must understand to put the spiritual rather than the physical and emotional. I, I see this as a big temptation, and I think that the devil is still using the same things today as he has since the Garden of Eden. Back there, he said to Eve, look at that fruit. And when she saw that it was good for food, uh, she was tempted. And Satan uses temptations. There wasn't anything wrong for her to be hungry, but there's something wrong for her to be disobedient to the word of God. And God said, you're not to eat of that tree. And so we come to this place. We realize that we're going to be tempted. Every one of us will be tempted. Not a single one will be exempted. No matter how spiritual you are, no matter how much you read the Bible or how much you pray or how often you go to church, you're still going to have temptation. And one of the temptations you're going to face will be the temptation to take care of the body rather than to take care of the spirit. Oh, let me illustrate it. Uh, you've had a hard day. You've done many things today. You sit down in that easy chair. Your body says you need the rest. Your spirit says you need the word of God that you get when you go to church. You hear the word, and you must learn to live on the word, but you, you need that rest. You're worn out. You're tired. And the temptation is to feed the flesh rather than to feed the spirit. Do you see he is saying something to us that's really important, and it's important for us to get it. It's important for us to say, yes, Lord, I understand that I'm to put under my body and keep my body in subjection and not, not my body rule me, but me rule my body and to take care of the spiritual rather than give in to the physical and emotional. That's the first temptation that he faced. And then the Bible said, then, verse 5, the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Now he took him into Jerusalem. The book of Luke uh, uh, describes it. He's going to Jerusalem, the holy city. And he takes him on a pinnacle of the temple. And that's very interesting. For those of you who study a lot, you can read that. And, and uh, the scholars don't know how far that pinnacle was from uh, the top to bottom. Uh, some say that it was high as a seven-story building. And some say it was 700 feet from the portico up here to the top down to the valley below. And so there's a tremendous area that you could fall in. Somewhere between 
75 and 700 feet. So that's a long way. And the devil says to him, he said, uh, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now he's saying, Jesus, if you're the Son of God, go ahead and jump off of this, because God's going to take care of you anyway. He promised that he'd send his angels and take care of you. So why don't you just prove to me that you are the Son of God? Go ahead and jump off and prove it. Jesus, the scripture said, now watch this. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The second temptation here is to misapply the word of God. To misapply it. I'll give, I'll give you an example. Here's a Bible that says, uh, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So you go out and you buy a new car and you buy a new house and you buy all new furniture and you buy new clothes and shoes and, and go on a cruise. And then the bill comes in and you get on your knees and say, oh God, you said you'd supply all my need according to your riches in glory. And, and the Lord whispers, child, I did supply all your need. You didn't need all that stuff. I supplied your need. Do you see, like Lester Roloff used to say years ago, he, he said, you've got to get your warner and your needer lined up. And, and you see what he's teaching us here is, that we can misapply the scripture. Uh, we can take it out of context. And if you take a text out of the context, you'll arrive at a pretext. That's a false conclusion. I want you to turn to the book of uh, Psalms, chapter 91. Psalms 91. And the reason I want you to turn there is because that is the passage of scripture that the devil misquoted. And that's the passage of Scripture that the devil misused. And so, look what it says in Psalm 91. I tell you what, there's only 16 verses here. We'll read them all. Read it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God's going to take care of you. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation." Did you see how the devil misquoted this? Now I want you to notice, he's, he left out in all thy ways. Uh, you know, he said uh, in here in verse 11, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. But when the devil quoted it over in Matthew, he left out in all thy ways. It's interesting that he leave that out because it's important to us to follow the Lord in all his ways. 
You know that verse that you've all memorized, uh, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He uses the same expression here, in all thy ways. Did you know what he is saying here? I want you to get this. Look at 91 again and look at verse number 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is thy, my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, therefore, he said, there shall no evil befall thee, shall give his angels charge over thee. Did you see what he's saying? You can't just lift that verse out of the, out of the context. The context is when you make the Lord your habitation, then he's going to take care of you. Did you know what it means when he said, you make the Lord your habitation? That's your dwelling place. He's talking about us walking in the light of the Lord. You know, you know the idea is habitation is where you live. It's as if he was saying, live in the sunshine. The sunshine surrounds you all over. It's as if he was saying, the air you breathe as it surrounds you. All oh, you live in this air. Then he said, uh, in, in Acts he quoted, remember he said, in him we live and move and have our being. Did you see what he's saying to us? Beloved, he's saying if we acknowledge that the Lord is with us always, if we live as if in total presence of God, if we walk in all our ways honoring him, then he's going to protect us from all harm. That's what he said. Did you get it? I want you to get it. Because you've made the Lord your habitation, because you've walked in fellowship with the Lord, he's going to provide your protection. Amen. May I say it this way? One step outside the will of God is the most dangerous place a Christian can be. In the will of God, Doing what God wants you to do, the way he wants you to do it, for his glory, is the safest place in the world. If you're in the will of God and it's God's will for you to live, you're going to live. There's nothing that can harm you. There's nothing. But we must abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We must make him our habitation. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. The story is told, you know, you heard the story about the little kid. He's out there with his daddy, and he sees this field of watermelons, and he watches, and he looks around, and he takes the boy, and he goes up there. He picks out this wonderful-looking watermelon, and he looks this way, and he looks this way, and he looks back, and he looks, and he's getting ready to cut that watermelon loose. And he hits, feels something on his side. And his son, what, what is son? He said, you forgot to look one more place. <laughs> Do you see, the Lord is watching over us. His eye is over the righteous. His ear is open unto their prayers. And God is with us. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Do you remember he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I mean, in, in his word, he's given us, I will not fear. I have security. I will not fear. I will not fear what man shall do. I will have security in the Lord. Now you watch this. If we are walking with the Lord as if the Lord Jesus was with us, walking by our side every moment, do you know how that would affect our speech? You know how that would affect how you talk to your wife and how you talk to your husband and how you talk to your kids? Do you realize that's what he's saying we need to do is Acknowledge him, acknowledge his presence with us always. He is with us. 
Now, we like to think about that when we're in need. We say, boy, he's with us. He is watching over us. He, but, you know, there's the other side of that. He is there hearing everything we say, seeing everything we do, and even reading our thoughts. Amen. He's with us. And we need to come to the place, beloved, where we live in his presence. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And the temptation here was to misapply the scripture and to forget what it takes to have the presence of the Lord guarding you and watching over you. And that is, he said, if you make the Lord your habitation, if you acknowledge his presence with you, then you'll have that protection. But not if you tempt the Lord in a foolish manner. God's going to take care of me, but that doesn't mean I'm going to run and jump in front of a moving train. You see, that would be foolishness, and we're not to tempt God in a foolish manner. But we are to trust the Lord. We are to see that He is with us. I, I wish for my own self and for my family and for you, the church family, I wish we could all get a hold of this. I, I wish this thing would become so real to us that we'd practice the presence of God with us always. I mean, he is there. And may we live in his presence. May we practice his presence. May we realize that he is with us. And let us make him our habitation. In him we live and move. Let us have our being and recognize that we belong to him and we're his, and he is with us, and we live in him. Amen. Oh, if we could do it, folk, if we could do it, there would never come a filthy word out of our mouths. There would never be anything that we would do that we'd be ashamed of. There would never be anything we'd do to have to feel like we have to hide it from somebody else. But we could just live because he is with us and we're living in his presence, practicing the presence of the Lord. And so Jesus said, it's written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God in a foolish matter. Well, reading on. Again, the devil, verse 8, taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, this is the devil speaking now, all these will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I go bow to you or anybody else. I want to worship the Lord God only, and the devil leaveth him. Now, I want you to see something here in this temptation. This temptation is a temptation to serve yourself and to live for yourself instead of living for God. It's a, it's a temptation as the devil is saying, if you'll just bow down, I'm gonna give you anything you could ever want in this world. I'm gonna give you popularity. I'm gonna give you wealth. I'm gonna give you all of this. He showed him all the wealth of the world and all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, all of this will I give you if you'll just bow down and worship me. I can make you popular. I can make you rich. I can give you pleasures. I can give you anything you want if you just bow down to me. And the temptation is to satisfy self and to live for self instead of living for the glory of God. Jesus said it's written, you know, you worship the Lord God, him only shall you serve. Now, I want to point out something here. I think it's important. The devil's a liar. The, the Bible says that he is a liar and he's a father of lies. And he was promised something he couldn't deliver anyway. I mean, the Bible calls him the God of this world and the prince of the power of the, uh, of that worketh in the children of disobedience, prince of the power of the air. But God is still sovereign. Jesus is still sovereign over all. And as Satan was promising him something, he could never have delivered him anyway. Oh, by the way, he does that today. Satan always promises more than he can deliver. You have never seen a billboard with a derelict on it. 
with a drunk laying in the gutter. You always see if somebody's advertising liquor, they're all happy and joyful and all that. They never show the end of it. Satan never shows the end of walking his way. Never. There's never been a person that ever took the first drink of liquor with the idea, I'm going to become a drunkard. Not one. No one's ever tried drugs with the idea, hey, I'm going to be an addict and ruin my life. No. Satan promises happiness and joy and pleasure and all the rest of it, but what he delivers is something quite different. The devil is a liar. Yes. John Rice, many years ago, wrote a pamphlet which he called, uh, All of Satan's Apples Have Worms. <laughs> Some wiseacre asked, you know, the fellow was eating an apple. He said, what's worse than finding a worm in an apple? He's finding a half a worm. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something's worse than finding a half a worm in an apple, and that's listening to the devil and being deceived by him because he promised you what he cannot deliver. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard, and it's always going to be that way. And the Bible promises, be sure your sin will find you out. And there's going to be judgment for those who neglect God and walk away and don't honor him. Here he's promising something and he's saying to him, just give in and live for yourself. Live for what you can get out of life. Live for popularity and, and uh, for praise of man and for all the possessions you can have and all the pleasures you can have. You just live for that. And uh, you can have it all if you just forget God and walk this way. But I guarantee you he's a liar and he always is a liar. And Satan will mislead anybody if he can drag him into hell. Satan and his teach false teachers, the Bible says they came to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what Jesus said. But I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. In me is life. You receive me, you have life, and you have life everlasting. But listen, the temptation that's given here is a temptation to get in love with the things of this world. When the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For any man who has the love of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so, understand today, the temptation that Jesus faced was given to us so we could understand that we, each of us, may never put the physical and the emotional over the spiritual. May we, before God, put the spiritual first. Always do the thing that's right, even if it's the hard thing. Do that which is right. First, don't give in to the lust of the flesh. Don't give in to satisfying the body. Live in the realm of the spirit. And then don't ever misapply the scripture. Rightly divide the word of truth. Learn the scriptures and learn to apply the scriptures to your heart and to your life and, and understand that scriptures have to be studied and you learn those scriptures and apply them to your own life. And then don't sell out to the world or for the pleasures of this world or anything that Satan has to offer. Put the Lord first and worship him. And he said, watch this, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Everything you need, everything that your heart could desire, if you'll seek him first. Many people seek the Lord somewhere down the list, but other things become first. Jesus said, to the church at Ephesus. 
I have somewhat against thee because you've left your first love. Some translate that, you've left loving him first. You see, we've got to seek first the kingdom of God. Before pleasure, before ease, before any of the desires and needs of the flesh, before anything else. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. What a wonderful promise we have from our Lord.